Okay, let's do some true or false problems that have to do with uh, eigenvalues, determinants, diagonalizability, uh, all the stuff that's going to be on midterm three. So these true or false are actually from the the midterm three last fall. So let's let's jump into part A. So it says true or false: every two by two matrix with eigenvalues zero and one is diagonalizable. So this one is going to seem it's going to be really easy once I tell it to you. The problem is like. Uh, coming up or is like seeing noticing the thing that makes this obviously true and the reason it's true is because you have a two by two matrix with two distinct eigenvalues so you know that theorem that says if you have n distinct eigenvalues then it's diagonalizable so once you notice that once you notice that you have two different two distinct eigenvalues and it's a two by two matrix then it has to be diagonalizable so this one's true for part B it says true or false every three by three matrix with eigenvalues 0 and 1 is invertible. So this 3 by 3, think about it really quick, and then and you'll see that this 3 by 3 matrix information is a red herring. Like it doesn't really tell you anything. It's just trying to confuse you. Like if A and B is testing, do you know the difference between diagonalizable and invertible? And when does it matter what the dimension of the matrix is? That's what this is kind of testing. But you guys know this. Part B is pretty easy because you know that theorem that says if you have an eigenvalue of zero, then the matrix is not invertible, right? So it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter that the other eigenvalue is one. The thing that you have to pick out here is that it has eigenvalue of zero. And then the theorem says any matrix with eigenvalue zero is not invertible. So this is false. So it would be true if, if there was a not in here. Every three by three matrix with eigenvalue zero and one is not invertible. That would be true. But the way it's written here, we circle false. Part C. True or false? If A is a square matrix and the determinant of A is non-zero, then the rows of A are linearly independent. So to do this, you got to know that the determinant of A equals the determinant of A transpose. That's one of those determinant formulas that you guys have to know. And so the fact that the determinant of A is non-zero implies that the determinant of A transpose is also non-zero. And if the determinant of A transpose is non-zero, what does that tell you by the invertible matrix theorem about the columns of A transpose? It tells you that the columns of A transpose are linearly independent. And if you notice, I mean, the definition of taking a transpose of a matrix is the rows become the columns. So like the first row of A is the first column of A transpose. The second row of A is the second column of A transpose. That's the, that's the, um, that's the definition of taking a transpose. So if the columns of A transpose we're saying are linearly independent, that means since the columns of A transpose are the rows of A, that means the rows of A are linearly independent. And then that's what it's asking. So part C is true. Part D, every upper triangular square matrix is diagonalizable. So for this one, to me, it screams out like counterexample. See if you can come up with a counterexample. So let's do that. Let's, let's come up with, for a simple case, let's just think about two by two matrices. We need an upper triangular matrix. So that means everything below the main diagonal is zero. And then we want to come up with a counterexample. So we want to come up with an upper triangular square matrix that's not diagonalizable. So it, we have to have... So if we had um, two different numbers along this main diagonal, this main diagonal reads off the eigenvalues, right? Because it's upper triangular. So if we had two different numbers on the main diagonal, then it would automatically be diagonalizable because it would have two distinct eigenvalues. So we need to pick um, the same number to, to be on the main diagonal. That way, we don't have two distinct eigenvalues, and then maybe the matrix won't be diagonalizable. So then we gotta figure out what can we put up here so that the geometric multiplicity of eigenvalue one is not two. We want it to be less, we want it to be one, right? So that it's not diagonalizable. Remember, we're trying to come up with a counter example. And do you guys remember the trick? When you take away the eigenvalue from the main diagonal, the number of free variables that you have is the geometric multiplicity of that eigenvalue. So we want to put a non-zero entry here. So if we put a one up here, then check this out. Here's our A then a minus lambda i, in this case where lambda, our only eigenvalue is one, that matrix looks like this, right? And 
And you could say right off the bat using that shortcut, there's only one free variable. So the geometric multiplicity of lambda equals one is just one. And so the geometric multiplicity doesn't equal the algebraic multiplicity because remember here, this eigenvalue of one is repeated. So it has algebraic multiplicity two. But since there's only one free variable in a minus lambda i, the geometric multiplicity is only one. So it's not diagonalizable. So we've come up with this counter example. This a is a, is a upper triangular square matrix that's not diagonalizable. So we say false. Right, so just really quick, I want to I want to mention just to be clear that the the reason that having one free variable means the geometric multiplicity is one is because the null space of this matrix a minus lambda i is the lambda eigenspace of a, and so when you write the solution set to like this matrix times v equals zero in parametric vector form, you're only going to get one basis vector because you only have one free variable. And so the null space is the span of that one basis vector, which is going to be a line because the span of one vector is a line. And so the dimension of that eigenspace, a line is one dimensional. So then uh, the, the geometric multiplicity is the dimension of the eigenspace. So the geometric multiplicity is just one. So I just wanted to explain why you can just look at the number of free variables of a minus lambda i to get the geometric multiplicity of lambda. Okay, so d is false because we came up with this counterexample. Part E says true or false. Every upper triangular square matrix does not have any complex eigenvalues. Okay, this one's kind of silly. And the answer to this is the fact that in linear algebra, in this class, we're only going to look at matrices that have real entries. So we're never going to have a matrix like, like um, 1 plus i. We're never going to have a matrix like 1 plus i, 2, 0, and 4. And then in this case, like you can read off your eigenvalues and you'd be like, oh, here's a complex eigenvalue. But we don't have this ever in linear algebra, okay? So we're only going to have matrices with real entries. So if you have an upper triangular matrix, like A, B, 0, and then C, you can just read off the eigenvalues along the main diagonal. And since the entries are always going to be real in this class, um, you're not going to have any complex eigenvalues when you have an upper triangular matrix. So this is true. Okay, I hope that helps. We did a lot of like procedural stuff in the previous videos and like calculations and this is like a good review of the theory. So I'll see you in the next video.